I'm Besa Luce, and welcome to Other Talking Points, a new K2.0 podcast. In Other Talking Points, I will be delving into a wide body of work that is produced across the region. Work that is sometimes overlooked, work that is less covered in the media, or work that opens up new perspectives on the region. So over the next couple of months, I will be inviting authors, scholars, artists, and activists from Kosovo, the region, and beyond to explore their work, ideas, and lives in order to bring you new perspectives on our world. We will be covering policies and analysis, historical and cultural studies, and works that provide insight into current affairs. For this first episode, I've decided to explore the topic of travel in the region. That is why and how we travel, and what it tells us about our shared past, our current sense of belonging, and our understanding of one another. For us in the region, this topic is of course full of political implications as well. Since the end of the wars in the 90s, narratives of division have continued to dominate mainstream politics and debate. And such narratives have shaped policies too. Non-recognition of identification documents, rigid visa processes, poor transportation infrastructure, and sometimes even hostile treatment at border crossings. These are just a few examples of how freedom of movement in the region remains a problem. Of course, such realities affect how people in the region connect or not with one another. Yet, when we speak of connection, it's usually in terms of political or economic benefits. That is how closer political connections and improved transportation infrastructure in the region will lead to economic growth. While improved political and economic links are important, what is often missing from such discussion is the importance of individual human connections. And this is the aspect of travel I'm going to explore in this episode. What drives people to travel and connect across borders in the face of tense political climate and barriers in the region? Would we start looking at our relations differently if we placed citizens' experiences and stories more at the center? I have invited two guests to explore these questions. Ilir Gocci from Belgrade, who works at the intersection of media, activism, art, and technology. And Riton Selmani from Pristina, a visual artist working in video installation, photography, and public interventions. Both are travel enthusiasts and have both created particularly interesting works that explore issues related to travel. Ilir, thanks for being on the show. Hi, Bessa. Thanks for having me. Dritan, great to have you as well. My pleasure being here. Okay, so when it comes to traveling around the region, I feel like there is such a diversity of experiences and, sh- and stories that people share. There are the more obvious political or even geographical factors that connect people between some countries more and divide others. But there are also other factors, such as generational differences in perspective and connection to the region. So how have the two of you experienced the region in your travels? What have been some of your main takeaways, especially regarding the types of connections that exist in the region? Ilir? Mm-hmm. That's a little bit of a complex question. The, uh, the first part about me experiencing the region, I think what's relevant for me personally is this um, experience of Yugoslavia, uh, of this common joint shared space that has suddenly, literally overnight, stopped to exist in the early 90s. And for me, traveling around the region, uh, and when I say region, I it's also that I don't only think about the former Yugoslavia space, it's also, I guess, Bulgaria and Romania and, and Greece even and Albania, uh, and also further east towards Turkey, I guess largely because of the Ottoman Empire heritage, uh, the Balkans. Um, it's about sensing the relationship with, between who I am and who we are, whoever we are and however we defined it, and, and this common space. 
So that's a very long and even more complex answer to the first part of your complex question. Okay, I'll, I'll just stick with you for a, a bit longer. What about the second part? Some of the main takeaways, like what do you find these, in these travels in the ways that people still connect? Mm, I think what I always love about traveling around the region is there is this duality between the known and the unknown. Uh, and if you travel to places like Taiwan and Australia or, or South America, you cannot get, get as much of the known as much as you can get in the Balkans. So you travel through spaces that you somehow know very well. It's like being in a dream of a place that you know, but you have never been there before. You understand how people are, you even understand the language. And for Kosovo, it's different because most of the region shares this one common language. But for the people speaking this language, it's like being in their home in a way, but then in a place that it's um, different enough for us to be interested in exploring it, if that makes sense. No, it, to it totally makes sense. And Dritan, maybe just to connect with, with you, do you share some of that experience that Ilir talked about or do you have a different perspective to it? Um, it's very important because I think, first of all, we need to mention this idea of uh, <clears throat> Ilir is not that older than me, but he comes from a he grew up probably also in a different place, but also in a different time. I grew up, like, let's say, in Kosovo. You grew up in Belgrade, right? Yeah. And then my perception is a bit different. I mean, probably also related to this being uh, the, the smallest country within Yugoslavia, but also, like, in many levels, also being landlocked, not just geographically speaking, but the idea that w we or I come from such a political and, you know, a complex place, the region, my region is a bit uh, smaller than your region, actually, because um, I still have this, you know, this uh, this lust of, of rediscovering my Yugoslavia or the Yugoslavia, which I never really experienced. So I'm more like I see, when when we speak about the region, maybe it's a, a, my my perception is a bit smaller. It might be also related to to the fact that I grew up on a countryside and, you know, this idea that I was not very well connected during my childhood. And uh, <clears throat> to go back to the second part, rela I mean, uh, re my relations, um, or what was the question? Some of like the main takeaways from when you, you're traveling, because you are traveling now. Yeah. So maybe while growing yeah, yeah. up, you were traveling, let's say, like you were yeah, more, yeah. smaller I'm, and stuff, traveling less. But I know that... We, I mean, over the past, I don't know, let's say I did. a few I, years, you've been traveling a lot. So what are some of the takeaways in, from that experience in how people connect with one another? I, 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 I can freely say I, I'm super excited to rediscover my past because somehow I'm at this missing point of what, what things were happening around. And now, let's say, I have been, in the last three years, I have been maybe over-present in the ex-Yugoslavian geography, I mean, uh, artic artistically speaking, with my projects and exhibitions. And then you, there are so many similarities that I hate what we have done to ourselves, politically speaking, because um, I think we have burned our skins, but the soul is still the same. You know, we say we have the same jokes, same approach, same vision. And as you said at the introduction, um, it might be more, uh, this world might be more interesting if we share the, the simple stories of people, really, because I, I really, really hate this, all this black cloud called propaganda. And uh, that's my perception. And I, I really love it because I go in peace anywhere around. <laughs> I think I think both of you brought in something that is very important. Also, uh, also how there's generational differences to how we uh, experience travel, and that generational difference difference, of course, is also uh, linked to a, polit a certain political moment of when we when we grew up. And I think today we'll hear a lot of, let's say, even like our parents, like older generations, talking of a time when they really traveled way easier across the region in a lot of. A lot of the countries, not to say for all of them, because I think Albania would be the, the exception in that regard. But they talk about this freedom and uh, this easiness in, in travel. And uh, today, a lot of those people from the older generations, you don't really hear them traveling. 
for fun, let's say, or just out of curiosity in the uh, in the region. And I think kind of more anecdotally, my perception is also that today more people will be traveling due to work or some very kind of specific engagement uh, uh, that they have, but people are sh less sharing the types of stories of I just went, I don't know, let's say to Sarajevo or to Podgorica or to uh, Tirana just for, for fun or for leisure. Of course, there's more connections between some countries uh, than be than between uh, between others. So, of course, the larger political narratives are also affecting people's uh, uh, relation and what they think is possible to do or what they think they can actually even, uh, even discover. How do you think these larger political realities and also the barriers that have existed between some countries have affected people's relationship for travel has it been discouraging them have you ever ever felt discouraged in that regard we know that between kosovo and serbia there's been issues of non recognition of identification documents between kosovo and bosnia and herzegovina there's been very rigid visa uh, systems visa uh, processes uh, uh, in place do you do you see amongst let's say f friends or people that you work with or hang hang out with a discouragement? Are you kind of like let's say an anomaly in that sense of somebody who's also just traveling for fun to discover the region? You there? Yeah. Mm, I think I would definitely say that uh, like the entire concept of the political elite is about discouragement because. Uh, largely, they're being, uh, they're preserving their power uh, through divisions and the um, core, uh, how to put it, the core uh, 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 perspective for divisions is, is nationalism across the region. So it is exactly about how successful you are in presenting uh, the reality of other peoples as foreign different, uh, different from us, again, whoever us, whatever us means, it is entirely based upon the success in, in this uh, endeavor to present others as distant, um, that d defines the um, strength of political power of the elite in the region. So most of the things they're doing is about discouraging people, be it on the level of visas, as is it was the case between Bosnia and Herzegovina and, and Kosovo, or I mean, simply in the sense, like whenever I come to Merdere or any other region uh, border, border in the region, I always feel very, un, I feel it unnatural, you know, not to say that there are borders that are supernatural, you know, like, uh, but you feel like someone decided to put this uh, policeman post, to put this barrier, and it doesn't make any sense, like 500 meters to the north, uh, kilometers to the north, there wouldn't be any borders. Uh, and it's, it would be a matter of political decision to remove these within a day. And nothing would change in reality to make this more uh, meaning, to make more sense out of it tomorrow than it is today, uh, in the sense that they're just put there to keep people apart. That's how I feel about, about that. What about yourself, Dritan? I mean, being from from Kosovo, I think uh, most people have potentially had some kind of uh, experience with these kind of uh, barriers. Let's take, for example, uh, travel between Kosovo and Bosnia. Have you had experiences in that regard? And I know, because I remember like just a few years ago, even within these kind of cooperations within civil society organizations, there would be travel and people would go through that lengthy process and painful, humiliating often process of getting a visa. But by some point, it would be very often for me to hear people saying like, I'm just not going to participate in this, uh, in this talk, in this workshop or in this conference, just because I just don't want to go through that, uh, that experience. I don't want to put myself through that experience. Do you have a similar story in that regard? How has it affected you? Um, I will tell probably two stories. I mean, <clears throat> unfortunately, I'm probably one of the few who have, have been traveling a lot to Belgrade mostly <clears throat> in the last years. And fortunately, I have been going there in the sense that too many people, uh, a lot of my friends here have this, you know, this stigmatization, this stereotypes of, about what's happening over there. And then the ones who go are lucky because they, they face this different reality, which 
as Iller also pointed out, I mean, it's, this is what propaganda does. This is what, you know, this this uh, discouragement by the political elite uh, is doing. And to go back to your first uh, words, I mean, this idea of, about our parents, actually, I'm I'm very happy because, let's say my parents, they, they never went to Belgrade after they got the last German visa, which was in 1998. And the plan was to go to Germany back then. We never went because of my dad's idea. We we even were in a in a in a refugee camp in Macedonia. He said no. We decide to come back. This and that. But then I find joy because they rediscover their own their own past by also attending my exhibition openings. This is very interesting for me because my dad always speaks Serbian to to the friends at the opening, and I think the. The the most repeated question he does is, is Driton a good artist or not? <laughs> and I don't understand it, but my friends tell me. And then uh, the the bad part about this is that I also feel at, at my parents' experience is that, I mean, Probably this is uh, this is um, a, a, an, an emotion which many people share. They are too allergic to what has happened to their own experiences and to our own past. And in in a way, um, them, I mean, anyone here tries to heal that experience by ignoring all this, you know, this travels around, and it it this uh, symptom has become a farce in a way you know to speak also in Zizekian, um terminology and um i i have no idea um this is this is my my feeling and i feel that we miss a lot because it's not that i have an urge to go to helsinki i really love to go you know, first of all, to see what's on the other side of the river and then maybe go to the next river because I feel that the bridges which were here or if there are bridges anymore, they 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 send me to, uh, you know, this very important places where, uh, you know, you can digest, buy, consume, present culture. And this is very important. And to have the blackout, which we have and we had, it's, I think that we are missing, all of us, not just, you know, this side of, uh, of, 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 of the geography or the other one. So I think both of you touched on kind of, if, if I can group them, like two very important elements. One is the, the consequences of the political climate and the political elites that want to keep the region divided. They want to, uh, uh, because they benefit basically from these narratives of uh, uh, of division. So I think that's very much true. That's what he did. You were talking about. And then there's the other aspect, Riton, about um, how older generations or our parents, let's say, have experienced the the region. So they talk about this time when it was easier to travel, but at the same time, today they're less inclined to to do to do so. So we grow up with these kind of narratives, I guess, uh, around us, and I think it po- potentially. Uh, it's it's something that, from for younger generations, that really has to be to be fought. They they have to f- have an urge or a need to, uh, uh, to 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 travel. So, how how would they navigate that? How can younger people navigate amongst all these different kind of let's say conflicting narratives uh, out there? Like, how can we build new narratives that there is something also to learn from one another or something new to discover, even though we're also very much alike in a lot of ways, <laughs> culture, culturally and, and whatnot. So how can we build new narratives that make younger people just be more more curious, have the same kind of urge that you were talking about, done of knowing what's on the other side of the ri- river, not necessarily having wanting to go just to uh, Helsinki? I think you, you mentioned a very important thing. Unless there is a need, almost even a very technical need for people to travel, they will travel less. Uh, I remember from like earlier this year, I think in February, I was in Ljubljana for a conference and I met a friend from Sarajevo. Uh, and these were the two capitals of the two republics of Yugoslavia, namely Slovenia and Bosnia and Herzegovina. And it was so shocking to me to discover that There is no direct bus line between Ljubljana and Sarajevo. There is, of course, no uh, airline between these two cities. There are no train lines, but there is not even a bus line. There is just one, and it's also indicative. 
there is a, there are a couple of buses running from some place in Austria or Germany, you know, taking uh, gastarbeiters back to their home, be it, be it Ljubljana or, or Bosnia, or usually Bosnia, and then they go through Slovenia. So there is, there is this external reason for this bus to run through Ljubljana and, and Sarajevo. And 30 years, 40 years ago, this would have been unimaginable because they were all part of the same country and people would freely travel and had reasons to travel. Nowadays, unfortunately, you need to have a very specific reason to travel. And I, I, I suppose it's the same in Kosovo. If I said I was going to Jilan for a weekend, people would be, why? You know, and if you say, if you, if, and this doesn't go for places like postcard places like Mostar or Sarajevo or, or Prizren, you know, no one asks you why, but if it's not a postcard place, then you need to have a specific reason. People are surprised. Uh, and I think this is really very bad because people need to step out of their comfort zone quite a bit to even think about exploring what's, as Driton said famously, uh, the other side of the river. And it also has to do uh, with how we understand the purpose of traveling. You know, like many people I talked to, they don't understand why I like sp spending time in Herzegovina, for instance. And Herzegovina is it's like a, a lost kingdom. It's like a fairy tale. You can travel Herzegovina for three months and you won't be able to, to discover like 10% of the, what there is to discover. But people sometimes think they, it's about what they desire. You know, they want to go to the European Union. They want to see beautiful towns. They don't want to see any poverty. They've seen enough of it in their own town. And I think it's also about our wishes and our understanding of what travel can bring to us. For me, like, I think always about these beautiful nuances, you know, all the way from, from Slovenia in the Northwest down to Albania or Turkey uh, in the Southeast, how culture slowly, you know, changes shape, like through language or through customs or through politics or how much people are accustomed to hanging out in the street at night. You know, it becomes more oriental as you move towards the east. And you can follow this gentle wave of nuances and it's so, it's, it's beautiful in itself. So it doesn't take much to enjoy traveling but by simply being out there and travel. And I think we, this is what we need to promote to the, you know, the, the um, uniqueness of the so-called ordinary, you know, even the smallest village, like we can go 15 kilometers outside Pristina and have the best day, you know, and meet amazing people and learn so many things. So, yeah, I think it's also about how we approach traveling and what's different and what's new. And I think actually in some of these, um, it is exactly maybe in some of these places where we would be able to find connections that we are not aware of between people. I think that's, uh, those are the types of places in this boring space or how you, you, you called in this, uh, the, the not so unique, but in just like a regular town and a very, in a very small village. I think those kind of places sometimes offer even more in just having conversations with, uh, uh, with people and just learning about one another. And I, this takes me very nicely, I think, into what I wanted to talk to you, Ilir, about uh, uh, next. And you mentioned buses earlier. And I wanted to talk about this story that you wrote this year for Kosovo 2.0. Uh, it was called the Alternative Balkan Postal Service. And, um, and I think the story is, and I encourage everybody to read it who who hasn't, because I think I think it's beautiful on so many different levels. It's very much based on your observation and your experience from traveling in the in the region. And then you talk about this how people have come to rely on private buses, not just I mean not just for personal transport, but also as a means to send things, to send items to uh, to one another. So whether via the the driver or by just a stranger who is happening to take that bus and asking them, can you deliver this to Pristina or to Belgrade or to Podgorica and somebody will pick it up uh, uh, on the other side of the, uh, of the border. And what I find particularly interesting in your story is when you're explaining that people are not necessarily sending just things that, uh, let's say, like things that, they, that, that have some urgency to it. Let's say there's cases of like a forgotten document or, or a forgotten item or whatnot, but they're also sending food. And I would like to, uh, and uh, yeah, which is something that you couldn't do, I guess, with a regular post service when 
it exists or if it exists be, because between some countries I think there's also issues in that but I, I want to just uh, uh, quote you uh, here so this is the quote from your story it's not things that travel it's people and only when people can't do they send things but even then in actuality it's not things that travel but people's feelings and I think it, this is, I think it's also kind of like the ending of your story. And, um, and I think among many other things, this kind of realization that you come to in your story, to me, speaks of the fact, to the fact that people across the region are way more connected than we are often made to think or believe. Because we talked about these larger narratives of division and how they make us only think about what divides and what separates us. But I think due to these narratives, I think we risk forgetting the cultural ties, the friendships that exist, the families that are living across uh, these border divides. So can you just explain a bit how you see these connections also being preserved through, through this alternative uh, uh, service? What it means to people in the, in the region to have this possibility to, to send a feeling from one place to another? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about uh, my trip yesterday from, from Belgrade to uh, Pristina and there was this point just outside Belgrade, like this side parking, the bus stopped there and all of a sudden there were some guys carrying this huge metal box. It, it looked like, uh, like a, a washing machine. It's just that it wasn't a washing machine. And then I, when he said it's people's feelings that travel, I, I thought like, what kind of feelings are they want sending with this huge metal box? It looks like, a, you know, uh, yeah, something really weird. Um, if it's okay to be a pessimist on the, this podcast, uh, I'm feeling that um, the quality of transport connections, uh, it, it fades out slowly. It gradually disappears. It's not going in the other way. And also these relationships, I guess most of them, were built in times before the war. Some of them were created, uh, for instance, uh, in between Kosovo and Serbia, it's, I, I would say like maybe 83% of all relationship created in this. It was created like by Mirdita festival or similar cultural events um, that would take a group of people from Serbia and bring them to Kosovo or the other way around. And I'm afraid that, uh, it's very difficult to create like a sustainable uh, and a model that would increase the amount of these connections. Whereas with time and with these nationalist peaks growing in, in countries around the region, uh, we have less and less of these networks. And with time, they gradually might fade away. Some will stay, but most will fade away unless there is like a more institutionalized effort to connect people. Otherwise, when it's, I mean, I've built so many personal connections in Pristina, but most of the people from Serbia have never been here, nor they would ever come. I often bring friends from Belgrade, and ho hopefully they will bring their friends. But it's just, I would say, a drop in the sea, and the sea is mostly dark from my perspective. So it doesn't change as much as we would want to change to make it a growing network of connections. Yet what, what would happen if this, let's say, this alternative service didn't exist, if just it ceased to exist? These like if people just said, like, okay, as of tomorrow, like, nobody can send anything to one another according to the buses, through the buses. Now, in these personal relations, you know, these emotions do act as a sort of a, like needle that penetrates, that will, will try to penetrate anything. I met a woman while working on this story, uh, and I actually mentioned her in the story. She organized collecting and sending humanitarian aid to, to Sarajevo during the siege, the 90s siege. Um, and she would tell me so many stories. And through these stories, you would s see how people would do literally anything to establish contact or to preserve contact. But it's just what one person can do. Uh, on the, the, the wider level of society, these efforts are very isolated. And sooner or later, they fall underneath, you know, the, 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 the pressure of, of what's being done to connect or 
make the societies go further apart from each other. So, um, yeah, people will go a long way uh, to stay in touch with people they care about. Uh, yet, there is a limit to what they can do. And we have seen it so many times across the region, you know, that there is simply a wall put between uh, people and, and persons and th they cannot go through that wall, which is really sad. Maybe do tend to link a bit also to to your work because I think I mean you've you've often engaged with the topic of of borders of questioning these ideas of belonging of construction of uh, of identity and also existing in the if I, like in between uh, uh, in between of like dichotomies and uh, I think you're particularly drawn to challenge ideas and notions of what we. Uh, perceive as, as reality. And there's also, again, to quote you via Kosovo 2.0, uh, there's a quote of you in one of the interviews you, you, you did with our magazine that, according to you, the artist in the region where I hang around is not just to be an artist, but also to try to touch a nerve. And I think you've touched these nerves with a, with a lot of uh, a lot of your work. Uh, for example, one that comes to mind is Offside in 2019 when you replaced the uh, uh, the Albanian flag, which was at the main roundabout uh, it, at the entrance of Pristina, and you replaced that with an offside uh, flag, offside from football. But then there's another work from earlier 2016, if I'm not mistaken, the Wanderlust, uh, which was when you put a giant life jacket on uh, the sculpture of the, the, the famous Italian singer Domenico Modugno uh, in Italy. And specifically to focus maybe at Wanderlust, I think this work seems very much as a response and an invitation to speak differently about migration, about privilege, but also about the denial that many countries and people face when it comes to, to the right to move uh, uh, to move freely and wanderlust by itself uh, it means the desire to uh, mm -hmm. to travel yeah and you you talked uh, also about how actually which I didn't know before I read an interview of yours that Madunio also had this crazy urge to travel so what meaning does wanderlust do you think what meaning does does it have in the in the region um maybe I mean most of the works which you mentioned maybe uh, are produced because uh, of another work which uh, I have to quote now because living in this sort of um, uh, habitat and being unable to to move freely and to even dream freely maybe that's why I produce this and that and I have another work which uh, I think it's very important to, to quote is where I wrote this sometimes I, I, I wrote I write sentences and I put them on, on vans on, or trucks and I want them to move and some people can read them while uh, hanging around the city so I wrote this when I see nothing I have to imagine something this is a real uh, mantra of how I, I operate within this this place, and um, uh, to go back to to uh, the the wanderlust definition for me, it's probably because I'm not able to move, and then I dream of moving, and then even when I moved to Italy on in this particular moment, I saw that other people were also like in in this in this particular moment of of their movement migration and then i also found this tragic uh, news in the newspaper and then i had to react and you also speak about this privilege which is very important word here because i think the whole division is uh, or the whole um um double wall of 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 silence which you see all around Europe particularly is this who is privileged and who's not. I think all these border structures and all these past controls and stuff are just, you know, to uh, classify who is who and who gets faster through, you know, these fast tracks. And um, I don't know. Um, that's my perspective. That's my per perceivement of, of it because uh, maybe I come from a non-privileged space or geography and then uh, I, I, I trans transcribe this into this, you know, visual artifacts, which might make sense, might even not. So <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, when you're talking in this context of not being uh, able to move freely from Kosovo, it's, I mean, yeah, we're talking about a very unjust or to say the least uh, policy and uh, position at this point by the European Union to keep just Kosovo as the only country in the region that still has to undergo the visa regime in order to uh, to be able to move freely. I mean, the this right to freedom of movement 
has been granted, I say, by the by the EU to all the other countries in the region since 2008 and 2010. We're 10, 12 years later, and uh, we still don't have it in Kosovo. I mean, it's being promised time after time now. The new date is 2014, but there's. I think people are also just tired from being pulled in this political game. And it's very interesting because I was uh, in Brussels a couple of weeks ago with work, and in this uh, political meeting, I said that people in Kosovo feel and experience uh, their life in Kosovo as, be, as living in a, in a ghetto in relationship to Europe. And it was not necessarily liked, you know, in this meeting that I was at, uh, uh, it was uh, they uh, they had a huge problem, the other person, with the fact that I used the word uh, the word ghetto. And then I just, it made me, <clears throat> excuse me, it made me realize just how little also the rest of Europe knows and understands the the region and we f- and we face that that a lot i think in the terms of how we're talked about how we're defined how we're expected to behave what we're expected uh, to say so how can we actually is this a momentum that maybe like but we haven't at the same time necessarily used this momentum also for regular ordinary people to get to know one another more in the region and just Make sure that we're connecting more, regardless of what our relationship with these bigger power power structures uh, uh, power structures are. So, how can we uh, just make sure that at least we're breaking some of these divisions, these borders within us? And I'm not talking about physical borders now, right now. Let's talk also about mental uh, mental borders. How do you do that through also your work, maybe? And I think Riton, you're traveling a lot with your work with your with your exhibition. What's your experience when you go to Skopje? You just had a personal exhibition there a week or two uh, ago. Um, how, how does that, what do, you, what do you think, like what do you get out of that process, I would say? Mm, I hate to say, but it's a, it's a rediscovery. I mean, we are so close. And then anytime I go there or even in Belgrade, it seems like uh, I'm Columbus or or I reach Columbus Island, and it's strange for me because it should have been different. But I think Ilir mentioned uh, previously, it's all connected to this, um, how to call it now, to this political after party. It's not even a party anymore. It's an after party and with some lame, lame music played and served to to us. And uh, what can we do? I I, I mean, I, I, I love this uh, famously uh, a question put on by Lenin, what needs to be done, what to do? And what to do, I think we're trying. All this, um, me is trying, a lot of friends of mine are trying, I mean, from this or the other side, but it's never enough. Uh, I was, let's say I was surprised because I thought this thing called Manifesta will bring a lot of people from the region, but then... Uh, most of my friends from Belgrade didn't come. I still don't know the reason, but I think they are just like probably uh, underplayed by by this uh, black cloud. Like I say, uh, like I said in the, in the beginning, and I wished that most of them had been here because, according to me, it was a very good invitation to see this place differently in a different context and also in something which might never come back. I mean, speaking about this cultural involvement of, you know, openness and arts and culture and stuff. And even that as a, as a, as a like unique, uh, happening didn't really trigger my friends who come from the art circle from Belgrade to come here. I mean, uh, this also applies to a few of my Macedonian friends. Let's say a friend of mine came to see Manifesta, I think, two days before the closure because we were working on my project in Skopje and I was like pushing him at least go and see it because it might, you know, it might take time to see it in the region and I think it was a very interesting project at least to be seen. I mean, not to judge it further because it all goes on down to personal experiences. So that's my, um, my perception. What to do... Um, it's very hard because I'm I'm an artist and an Aquarius and a dreamer, but it's not enough. And especially if you dream uh, for a long time, and if you dream the same dreams, ah, they just become uh, deja vu's. And I hate 
to be in a place with so many deja vus. I mean, you mentioned visa regime. What can I say now? It will take 24 hour podcast in order to express my whole uh, feelings and experiences with any embassy I have been to. I mean, it's it's not ghetto. It's it's a betrayal which has been happened to this uh, to this country. Let's say because this country exists because of the help of the little help of the others in Beatles terms, and these others then f- suddenly left the island, and uh, you're not able to reach the other islands because you are the black sheep. You are the other one. And uh, for sure, they don't understand you. They don't understand me because they are privileged and we are not. That's it. And uh, if you're not able to travel, uh, you're not able to see. If you're not able to see, you're not able to learn and reflect. We have this great expression in Albanian, an old saying, which it says, uh, the one who travels is equal to the one who is educated. So at least if I'm able to travel to Helsinki, even for a pizza job, it's enough. But I'm not able to do that as well. I think it's interesting that you had that kind of uh, experience that you're talking about now with Manifesta and not having some people also from the art world coming to Brigina to visit, because I think usually the assumption would be that in terms of connections and and travel, there's certain sectors or fields where that happens, and it happens a lot, and it happens without a problem. I would assume, for example, myself, that it happens in the art world. It happens a lot, let's say, between civil society uh, organizations, but then we try to think of how can it step outside of that and go more on the ordinary basis or so not to have it just be for business, for example. So I find that very interesting that that was a, a, an experience. And I think it's also maybe with how Kosovo and Pristina are still not fully un- understood or known by the, uh, by the rest of the by the rest of the, the region. Would have been, Ilir, you talked about earlier about also bringing friends from Belgrade to visit Pristina, how how was that uh, uh, experience? And also, what are what were the type of places or stories that you thought it was important for them to places to visit, stories to uh, uh, to hear? How was how did that work out with, with your friends? What are did they have expectations or what? How did they have a good time ultimately? Or what is it something new that you would hear them say that they've learned or discovered by coming uh, here? Mm-hmm. I think that between Serbia and Kosovo, it's uh, fairly easy to um, make people feel excited and that they are discovering something new. Uh, because sadly, um, in so many ways, the realities of the two countries uh, are somehow mutually exclusive. Uh, how people, like when I come from Belgrade to Pristina, it's it's literally like stepping into another world where, where some things are seen in a very different way from how they're seen in Belgrade. Uh, and it also connects to how media image of Kosovo was created in Serbian media starting uh, as early as early 80s and maybe even before that time. For most of the people in Serbia and Belgrade in particular, like Kosovo is like... You know, when you think about Sydney, you have an image in your mind. But when they think about Pristina, most of them don't have an image in their head. So any image fits the excitement criteria because they don't know anything about what things are like. And then um, for me, uh, Kosovo is, now I will sound maybe a bit too touristy, but it's an amazing place. You know, and I tend to over idealize things. So I'm able to talk about Prizren during DocuFest for like five hours. And I people I think people like uh, the idea of, of that place through the stories I got from that place. Uh, so I think it's very easy to make them excited about this. And I, I also think it's very important for them to feel uh, that they can rely on the should they call it a mediator, someone who's on somehow both sides, someone they know and that they trust, and then someone that also knows the place. So I I serve as an interconnector somehow for them, which makes it much more 
much easier for them to connect to place here because I have friends and then my friends become their friends as well. And otherwise it would be much more difficult for them to, to meet, you know, meet the locals. Uh, and, um, so this, this I think works. And every time like DocuFest, they always think about it, uh, like, uh, please rent during summertime as this most wonderful entry point for people who want to get like the first entry point to Kosovo, I always recommend go there because it's, 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 it's huge. It's wonderful. The weather is nice. The old town is beautiful. You have like hundreds of good films around and other cultural events. Uh, you can go to the mountains, you can do this, you can do that. And from that point, you can continue exploring. I mean, you can do it of course in any other way, but, uh, I also think it's important to, um, um, yeah, bring people to the spot and just let them experience it. Um, I mean, you've been bringing people, you've been bringing also things, <laughs> as explained in the alternative uh, postal service. And there was something also going back to the story that I found very interesting, uh, is that for me, it also showed how people trust more one another than they do institutions uh, in the story. I mean, you were a bit more pessimistic earlier because you explained it in the sense of uh, that people use also these services or it's just to maintain the connections that have existed from 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 the past, but not necessarily, and kind of the implication was that not new connections are being created, but actually I think in your story, it shows that also new connections are being created between people by using this uh, uh, this service because a stranger stranger will walk up to a stranger and say, "I have this very important document. I need it to be in Pristina. Can you please take it?" And somebody will wait for you on the other side to pick it up. So there's this level of trust there that uh, I think it's very peculiar and I think it's very important also and I think it's something that maybe is a that we should cherish more about mm -hmm. what makes us who we are within this uh, 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 this region and it also talks about that that they tr we were more inclined to trust the stranger than to actually trust the post service to efficiently deliver a document you know especially like a new, I would never myself for example send an important document by post office <clears throat> I remember during the 90s when we or even post 99 I would all my father used to work at the Museum of Kosovo and whenever I needed to receive something important I would put the address of his work because I thought okay the Museum of Kosovo they're not going to lose a, a document that they're sending to the museum I, I never put like the home the home address and a lot of these things I think are also a bit inherited uh but but they're also uh, reflective of the lack of trust today mm -hmm. so are there other avenues or spaces where this type of trust manifests itself that we might not be aware of mm, if there is I'm not aware of it <laughs> well, you do a lot of, for example, well, I thought of like something for you, no, but I mean, you do a lot of hitchhiking also. And I think there's also, uh, there's this trust that needs to be established mm -hmm. when you're hitchhiking between, between people. Yeah, when How it comes to trust, worked? yeah, I guess it's a little bit extreme for most people. But also when we talked about privilege earlier, it took me some time to realize that the fact that I can freely hitchhike day or night around the region or Europe or wherever, it's also part of a privilege of being men, you know, because when I would talk about this amazing adventures to my female friends, like most of them would always say, oh, I wish I could do the same. And then I was like, oh, why cannot you? And she was like, well, because I'm a woman and it's a bit different. And I was like, oh, sure. And then I realized that the most important part of my travel experience, maybe even more important than that, is simply out of reach to like 52% of living population of, of this country or my or any country. Uh, and that's, that's, that's kind of ridiculous. And with hitchhiking and trusting, um, now if we disregard the privilege part, um, I think it's really understanding that once you let yourself trust, you get abundance of evidence that you should trust. And I think even mathematically, it works as a formula. Like I have it in, in paper, I can, I can put it in paper. If, if this was a visual podcast, I could be able to show it to your audience. But like, uh, if you trust 100 people, my experience is that maybe five people will like, screw you over. And that's five out of 100. What you gain from 95 is so immensely much more 
from what you lose from those five. That's even rationally, it's because once you show trust, people, almost everyone trusts back. It's, I think, it, it's sort of a psychological uh, mechanism that we are built on, you know, to like when you see someone is trusting you, you return that trust by trusting this person. And hitchhiking is largely about this. It's like a upward spiral of trust. There is nothing in the beginning, but then one person shows trust, the other person responds, and then with this response, I show more trust, and then it goes up and up and up and up. And it's, it's, it's even hard to describe the, the levels of, of closeness and intimacy you can create in a, in a truck, you know, driving between Sarajevo and Zvornik on a rainy November day, you know, with a guy that you never met. Who might also had uh, he might had a very different uh, experience and understanding of war from what you have, of uh, of social issues, of political issues, and you, then you enter this truck and you realize that this person is so different from you. But then it's raining outside and you need him, you know. And then from his perspective, he doesn't want to kick you out because you're a guest, and we know how guests are treated in the Balkans. Uh, and then you have to start building connection and you find a way to connect to this person and all of a sudden you're your friends. And then when you go back to these issues that you were disagreeing about in the beginning, you disregard them as not as important as they used to be. So it's also for me a lesson about um, getting connecting to people in a genuine sense. And I think language also is, an, is another place, I think, where... Uh issues related to, to trust manifest themselves and we've touched a bit about it because we're coming close to the end of uh, of the show but I think language is also key because um, you talked at the beginning Dritan how you, your father hadn't been to Belgrade for a long time and then actually went back because of your exhibitions there and then like he managed to connect through a language that he, he spoke in his youth to connect even nowadays with people uh, with people there and I think Also, for example, it's happened, uh, I know, just a couple of months ago, like tra even traveling within Kosovo, and I went uh, with, a, with a few colleagues, uh, we were going to a work event, and we were in Gracianica, and we got a bit lost, and then we stopped at a gas station, and Gracianica is majority Serb community in Kosovo, and we, we asked the guy about directions, and he replied to us, we spoke to him in English, but he was a lo local Serb, and he replied to us in Albanian. And there's something, when we speak one another's language, there's something, there's a different relationship that also gets um, uh, uh, created. And even if we cannot fully converse with one another in, in one another's language, I think there's also these kind of cultural expressions that we, uh, uh, that we share. How has that been for you when you've traveled? Um, um, it, for me, it was difficult because I I grew up uh, like uh, literally uh, avoiding or like protesting against uh, everything uh, which was coming from uh, the TV program called Belgrad One, Belgrad Two, and then uh, only after I grew up, I understood that there's this huge gap which is causing me a lot of you know, missing out of information and communication because I can't speak Serbian. And I remember I was included in a group show which traveled around the ex-Yugoslavian uh, republics, including also the two provinces, Yugos uh, Vojvodina and Kosovo. And then there was this momentum where I, f I thought like, this is like a bit weird because any participant had to speak English only because of me. And then the whole conversation changed because they were joking. They were, they, I mean, my friend from Ljubljana was translating a bit to me. Every single word which they were speaking about was about this, you know, this pop stars and this music bands, which I didn't know because I grew up in a parallel universe uh, with RTL 5 from Germany, this, this uh, satellite dish programs. And this is a huge gap this is a huge uh, thing i mean communication language and if 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 it happened that if you know let's say if you know serbian in kosovo i think it's a it's a great thing because it's not that you just speak a language but you also understand another culture and the jokes and all these things it's for me it's a, it's a great asset of even approaching like your own people and let's say grashanita Uh, so um, that's my perception. Um, 
and uh, I wish I could speak, I can't. And very often, even humor changes, and we can't even translate some jokes because we, if you if you make uh, regional jokes into English, I'm pretty sure they won't make sense. So, what can I say here? <clears throat> okay, so now just for for the end, very quickly, I wanted to. Ask the two if you can share when you might have depended on these uh, alternative service uh, or yourself in the region. So I'm, I'm assuming that you have because I know I've I've used it uh, just recently when I went to Albania and I forgot a pair of shoes that I really needed to have with me. And I had somebody from Pristina put them on the bus and send them to uh, to, to Tirana to pick it up. Uh, but so what about you? What have you sent or received and uh, what meaning did it have for you? Um It happened to me once. Uh, I did the stupidest thing possible. Uh, I took my ex-girlfriend's uh, laptop charger and I left my charger at her place. And we both needed the charger the next morning because we both work and are critically dependent on our laptops. So I was like, yes, I can solve this easily because I know how this alternative postal system works. And then there was a bus line driving from Belgrade to Pristina, and then the next morning they would drive back. So it seemed it works perfectly, uh, except for the payment part. Uh, and I think I also, I, I talk about this in the story, and the reason why is because of this, because I was thinking, you know, it's uh, 15 euros one, one way for a person. So how should you, uh, how much should you pay for a charger? You know, they, they, they always say, Oh, pay as much as you want to, but it never means that, you know, you always need to. So I was like, hmm, is five euros enough? You know, it's a small charger, you know, it doesn't take too much space. And I was like, yeah, five, five euros is fine. So when I gave this guy, the bus driver, five euros, he was like, are you serious? You know, and I, I thought like this guy will never, ever help me again. So yeah, that's my story. Uh, I also have a lot of stories because I um, I have been collaborating with a gallery uh, which is based in Belgrade and then literally I sent everything there and I struggled a lot actually. My biggest struggle, struggle probably have been um, last year They th my gallery decided to include me in this uh, fair, this Arco Madrid in Spain and then they requested that I do send this recently uh, produced work which was a handmade mosaic and the problem was not the mosaic which was like made from a recycled tile but the box of it it literally meant that it's something uh, serious and unique and you know but we also we only did that to protect the mosaic so literally i was at the border for five days because they were sending it back and then i made all kind of papers to make it uh, go there and at the end This friends of mine from Adio Tours said, come and pick it up. We are unable to send it. And then we arranged this, uh, you know, speditor to come and pick it up. But literally I have sent and received uh, like very weird stuff. Like I have made a passport project uh, through an invitation which to do a show in Geneva. And then literally I was also sending this passport editions of mine to Belgrade very often. But the good thing is that the guys from the buses, they are, I mean, uh, very, very, like two gentlemen very often. They don't care. I mean, they don't ask too much money and you also build a relationship with them and trust. And then, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a good story. And also it's a, how to call it? It's something which you can't stop. I mean, this relations stop Postal service might have been stopped. I also never used post post offices to send stuff in Serbia. I'm not sure if you can do it, but uh, the life of people never stops. The relations never stop. Feelings never stop. So that's my perception. And uh, yeah, um, I don't know. Were they shipping uh, plasma during the blockage from Serbia through bus lines? <laughs> There is always someone <laughs> carrying a plasma. <laughs> even, even when I went to the U.S. One, a few years ago, I was uh, entering the U.S. and at the customs control, uh, the American woman, the police officer, she said to me, do you have any uh, plasma, pasteta, argeta? So oh people God. send, I mean, <laughs> but I think people also send them because it's it about be the a, feeling. I get the pecan, right? 
Sorry? I get, I get the pecans. Exactly. Right. Of yeah, course, yeah. it has to be pecans. Yeah. Uh, so, yes, but I think that people do, people stand, because I think, as I quoted you a little earlier, I think ultimately it's not necessarily about the item itself, but it's also about the memory or the, the feeling that people uh, are sending to one another. Ilir and Riton, it's been wonderful talking to both of you. Thank you so much for being my first guest on the show. Thank you. My pleasure. Other Talking Points is a K2.0 podcast. You can listen to it regularly on our website, kosovo2.0.com, or by subscribing to Kosovo 2.0 on Spotify.